Hello. I'm Tilda, and I'm here today to talk about pivoting to React at scale. Some things I'll be covering are an overview of the architecture choices we made at Pinterest, things that went well, things that did not go so well, and high-level conclusions. It is the way of the world of front end that you are going to be pivoting your web framework every two to five years. As Amy pointed out in her awesome talk yesterday, the joy and the pain of JavaScript is that there are a lot of different ways to do the same thing, and your conventions are in flux. That leads us to have more paradigm shifts, pivot more frequently. When I first started at Pinterest in 2013, my very first project was finishing the pivot from a Django app to a Django app with Backbone on top of it. It was pretty painful because the last 20% of that rewrite took 80% of the time of the project. So this time around, we wanted to think a little better, be a little smarter about it. In order to know where we're going, we have to think about where we've been. So I picked 2013 because that was the last time we did a significant pivot. In 2013, web development was very different. jQuery was the most common paradigm of the day. We had a bunch of competing or frameworks such as Ember, Angular. React was just starting to enter the scene. And cross-platform compatibility was Definitely a headache. So in 2013, we had an app that was built on top of Backbone and Django. Architecture kind of looked like this. It was built on top of Django's middleware, which is not, I don't think, Django's strong suit, but whatever. Um, we had a Python router. We had Python resources, which are like a wrapper around the API. And we had modules. Modules are little reusable, composable bits of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So they compose our whole entire tree. How many of you have worked on kind of like a Frankenstein app like this, where you had like different pieces of things glued together? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Kind of sucks, huh? I mean, it was OK for what it was, but there were problems. Even on a fast connection, on a fast machine, like, scrolling the Pinterest grid was kind of janky. We got called out for having some of the most bloated CSS of any big website. And we had to maintain two rendering code paths. So we were server-side rendering in Python, which you have to server-side render for SEO, and we're client-side rendering in JavaScript. Maintaining those two was not fun. So 2016 rolls around, and React is definitely kind of the winning the framework war, at least for right now. And it's pretty easy to see why. If you take functional programming concepts and apply them to front end, it eliminates a whole class of bugs that you see if you're like making assumptions about the state of your DOM and writing imperative code. Plus, it's extremely fast. So it was a pretty logical choice. React isn't the only thing that's changed, though. We have ES6 giving us the spread operator, arrow functions, and classes, all that sweet, sweet syntactic sugar to make JavaScript more of a joy to write. We have better support and tooling for Node. And we have Babel and Webpack, so we can just transpile all the things and not worry so hard about supporting different browsers. So right now, this is kind of what the Pinterest architecture looks like. We've got a node process talking to the Python API, and we have both Denzel modules and React components. Why both? Well, once you get to Pinterest scale, pivoting your app takes a while. But what do I even mean by at scale? It is such an overloaded term. The context that I'm setting here is at scale means source lines of code and numbers of developers. I was really surprised to find out that we have almost 500k lines of code in our web app alone, 
And that's not including node modules or blank lines. I also I discovered that we have 164 web developers based on the highly scientific method of seeing how many people are hanging out in the web rooms of Slack. So given that we're even bigger now than we were last time we pivoted, how could we go about this in a smart way? When in doubt, just you know, go back to the, the basics, the building blocks of computer science, data structures and algorithms. So what kind of data structure is a web application most like? Well, it's a tree. What kind of algorithms do we have for changing things in trees? You could either start at the root and walk down, or you can start at the bottom and walk up. We chose starting at the bottom and walking up in order to have a forcing function to make everyone convert things over. As if we allowed people to just kind of start in the middle and render Denzel modules from inside of React, if they could start anywhere in the tree, they would not be motivated to port everything over. They'd rewrite the cool, fun, sexy things that give you a boost and then ignore all the other cruft, and we'd be maintaining two worlds forever. We didn't want that. So that was kind of a high level of what we did. Now I'm going to dive down a little bit into the nitty gritty of things that went well. So when you get to Pinterest size, you got a bunch of teams. Like, let's say we have about 10 teams writing web code. All those teams have different metrics that they care about. Every team, we had them wrap their features in individual experiments so we could measure the gains we've got, which is really motivating both for individual developers and for management to continue to understand why Re React should be a priority. And we got some really sweet gains. Let's talk conversion numbers. Does anybody want to take a guess on the percentage improvement we got in conversion rates from switching our pin page to React? Oh, come on, I don't have candy. Anyone have a guess? 30%. No, not quite, but 10%, that's pretty good. And 5.6% on interest pages. We also recently ported the profile page over. It dropped average time to first interaction by 22%. Uh, the 10% increase in page views was for profile pages, but then there were also other downstream effects, like, which makes sense because people look at the profile page, it loads pretty fast, and they're like, sweet, I'm going to click on some other stuff. We got a 7% increase in international sessions and a 1% increase in overall sessions. The bigger increase internationally makes a ton of sense because those users were undoubtedly hurting the most from our crappy latency before. Another thing we did is we shimmed Backbone. Before we even started porting to React, we took Backbone and made it so that we had 80% of the functionality, but it didn't have the dependencies that it had before that were quite bloated, like jQuery and underscore. This allowed us to significantly reduce the size of our bundle and still be able to run Denzel. We also updated Denzel to use declarative states. Imperative to declarative is a pretty big mental shift that we're asking developers to make. And React is a big change, too. So by decoupling those changes and giving people a sequence to learn things in, it's a little less of a cognitive load. So this was a mistake that we made in Denzel that we did not make in React. Your designers are going to want to pivot how the website looks every two years, too because that's just the world that they're in. There are trends in visual design as well. And it is so tempting to be like, well, if we have to rewrite everything anyway, we might as well just you know, change how it looks. But don't do it. The reason why is because with Denzel, we had all these metrics drops that were super hard to debug. It was like, are users interacting with this page differently because it looks different? Or is there actually a bug in here somewhere? We made the same mistake with our iOS rewrite recently. I don't know what we were thinking. But with React, we said no, and it was much smoother. 
So when you have 164 people, how do you make sure that everybody stays on the same page? People have different learning styles. Some people are visual learners, some people are verbal learners. So we have to cater to everybody. For people who prefer email, there is an email list, web platform announce. And then we had a Slack bot that you could invite into your channel and get those same updates if that's how you roll. For people that prefer in person, there was regular office hours that anyone could come and ask questions to or get debugging help. And we had a wiki page as well, which is really important, especially for women or other underrepresented minorities or people who, statistically speaking, are going to be less comfortable asking questions. Oh. So it's one thing to put the information out there and tell people what kind of things you expect of them. But how do you actually make sure that they're writing code that meets your conventions? Lint all the things. React is particularly suited to linting because the output of JSX is an object that you can easily inspect and be like, oh, hey, this image doesn't have an alt tag, and that's really important for accessibility. We've open sourced our linter um, configuration. And I would also encourage you to check out this ESLint JSX accessibility plugin if you care about accessibility, and you should. OK, so that was what went well. Here are things that I might do differently next time around. I don't know about you, but learning a new framework is sometimes hard, scary. And especially with React, there's like not just React itself, but all this other stuff around it. I dived in and I was trying to learn ES6 and JSX and React and NPM, and I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. If I had to do this again, I would put a suggested order of learning operations on the wiki so that people who are junior or more just new to web or whatever have a way to sequence their learning and not get overwhelmed. I agree with Pete Hunt that this is a pretty good learning order. And you might not even need all this stuff, depending on the size and complexity of your app. So as I mentioned before, we forced people to convert from the leaf nodes up in order to make sure that they would port everything over. But there is a use case we missed that was kind of a duh which is like people were going to want to add entirely new page types that didn't exist inside Denzel. We were able to get it working, but it was a little bit hacky, and it would have been better to invest some time in thinking about that up front. We also kept the HTML structure of the pages exactly the same. This allowed our measurements to be a true apples to apples comparison. However, it also meant that we had to write more code to keep up with shitty practices from the old system. We didn't have a great plan for data flow out of the box. We were like, just use set state. But when you have an app with a deeply nested component structure, then you fetch the data and you're passing it down from child to child to child. These days, we have, we're using Redux and we have a higher order component that fetches data. So it's much easier, and we should have set that up straight out of the box. A mistake that Denzel made was coupling data fetching and rendering in the same function. The reason why that's a no-no is because it allows developers to just kind of gloss over performance problems by pretending there isn't a loading state. Well, there is a loading state, and you need to deal with it. When you're writing React components, you need to think about what your component's going to look like when there's no data. The reason that this impacted our rewrite or made it harder was because when people are porting over their Denzel components, they had to think about things like loading state that they hadn't previously considered. We did not set up our testing framework soon enough. And consequently, our unit test coverage has suffered a little bit. 
Once developers have shipped things and the code is in the wild, you are not going to get people to go back and write unit tests. It is not going to happen. If I would have known how easy it is to use Enzyme and Jest, this would have gotten set up a lot sooner. In fact, I'd even go so far as to say the true value of React is testability, not speed. There are tools now so that you can render a string to a DOM node and diff it, and it's, it's still fast, but not nearly as testable. And finally, we didn't have a good CSS strategy. That was semi-intentional, because we were already changing so much stuff we didn't want to change everything all at once and overwhelm people. But the thing about writing React is that it makes it immediately obvious that global CSS is a bad idea, in the same way that global variables are a bad idea. Because we didn't provide teams with clear guidelines on what to do, it was kind of like the wild, wild west. Some people were using uh, BEM styles, some people were using inline styles. We're in the process of cleaning that up and moving to CSS modules, and it's going to be great, but we're not there yet. So at a high level, what did, what did we learn from this? The more you can iteratively update the semantics of your old system to match the new system, the easier your rewrite is going to be. Now, we did a little bit of this with Backbone Lite and with updating Denzel to use declarative states. But we could have gone way further with it. For example, we could have updated Backbone's lifecycle methods to match React's component lifecycle methods. So how is code like DNA? Did you know that the kind of nutrition that your grandmother got when she was pregnant with your mother impacts your birth weight and your health throughout your life? This is not, and it's not even because of DNA. It's because of epigenetic markers. So in the same way that code, you write it and then you run it, DNA is written, we'll just call it written, and then it's run. Your body runs it and turns it into you. Epigenetic markers are like metacode that tell your body how to run your DNA or how, to, how your genes should be expressed. Like a rewrite, they're passed down from generation to generation. So it's epigenetic markers that deal with the fetal nutrition stuff that I just mentioned. Your rewrite, the choices you make now, impact not only this rewrite, or not, not only the next rewrite, but the following one after that. Fundamentally, engineering is about making trade-offs. So when you go pivoting your app, Choose your own adventure and choose wisely. Thank you.